there similarities between IDF and the Indian Army in terms of professionalism? What, what do you, your views on IDF? Of course, they have the backing of the United States. Uh, they have the backing of most of the European Union. And they have a backing in uh, various other uh, parts of the country, uh, of the world. But the fact remains that besides being backed by the Western powers, they have stood on their own because it is a matter of survival. They don't have a choice. And that is why the IDF, which is about 6.5 lakhs uh, strong, uh, serving or the people who are enrolled at any given time is, is about 1.7, 1.8 lakhs. And the rest are reservists and a little bit of the paramilitary. But the best part of the IDF is that everyone is a soldier because they are fighting for their mere survival and nothing else. So they may be 6.7 lakhs strong, but every human being is a soldier. You would have seen in the recent clashes, uh, an old Israeli, 95 years old, is donning a helmet and he's worn his bulletproof jacket and he's ready to fight. There are many generals who have come out. Even here, there were videos of this uh, retired uh, general who came out and he said, all I had was a pistol. Yeah. And immediately after the attack on October 7th, he was out on the border. IDF is being accused of um, lying. Um, that there was no killing of children. There were no... I have... Everybody is focused on whether children were beheaded or no. That's the whole debate. I, I want to draw a parallel here. Uh, just after the Pulwama attack, um, this is probably no, not just after but maybe a couple of months after the Pulwama attack. There were elections around the corner or something like that if I remember. There was a whole narrative spread across the country that the Indian government has asked the Indian army to do this and the Indian army has done this to its own um, CRPF uh, paramilitary soldiers. And this is a very popular narrative among Muslims across India. This was a lift conversation I heard of among two Muslims who were, I was going down. I, it was, took me a little while, you know, by the time I reached it, we were exiting. That's when I tried to challenge these guys, but they were, of course. Uh, so, I want to come to that whole aspect of the Indian Army and this narrative later. But just in context of IDF, do you think they would be absolutely lying and spreading misinformation? You see, one must realize that Israel is a state, nation state, and Hamas is a terrorist organization. And when I talk of a terrorist organization, it's an Islamist terrorist organization. And Israel is surrounded by 18 to 19 such Islamist terrorist organizations. They have different names, but the fact is there is an Islamic Jihad Council, there is Hezbollah, there is Hamas, there is Fateh, there is PLO. There is Palestine Authority, they are Iranian IRCG, and you name it and they have it. Now, besides that, there is ISIS. If you go a little beyond, there is Taliban. If you go into the African continent, there is Boko Haram. You see, so it is not, and if you look at the terrorist organizations the world over, you will find that 98 to 99 percent of terrorist organizations have an Islamic flavor to it. So, this is something which happens now because of the age of the social media, because of the information warfare which is taking place, it's a battle of narrative. Pakistan, I was three years in Islamabad, whenever something like this happened, it was always a false flag operation that the Indian army has done it and they've done it so that they can win the elections, the federal government has done it so that they can ga gain sympathy vote or something like that. So this narrative is funded by money coming from the world over, especially from the Middle East. This narrative has a sinister agenda where they don't want Hindu rasht, which they are saying, or Hindutva to flourish within a secular kind of a larger edifice of our nation. So the fact is that this kind of a narrative will be there, but the world at large knows, and I am sure these speakers who are giving this kind of a narrative, narrative, also know at large that what the kind of atrocities Hamas has done on, on the old, on the ladies, women, on the children, on, 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 on the elderly and, and created. And that is the main difference between Israel and Hamas. Israel 
uses the IDF to protect its civilians. Hamas uses its civilians to protect its terrorists. Let's talk about that. This is clear, right? I mean, they, they keep refuting this. No, they keep refuting it. But the fact is that the rockets are in the schools. Yeah. Rockets are just next to the hospitals. I even heard that the headquarters of Hamas was at the basement of a hospital for it several years. It will be. It will be. Now, today, unfortunately, their main hospital has been yeah. bombed. Now, now Israel is rebuting it that it is one of because forty percent of the rockets because they are indigenous made. The water pipelines which were supplied to uh, Gaza Strip from the world over were being used to make rockets. So, if they were there, they were very crude kind of rockets which were made, and forty percent failure rate, they would fall within Gaza. That if you see, they say that it has to be proportionate kind of a response. Now, I was seeing a, a kind of an interview somewhere and, and very rightly, the anchor, uh, the, the, the one who was being interviewed, he asked the anchor, it was a BBC kind of a thing. He, she said, he said, what do you mean by proportionate? If they attack 20 of my city villages or kibbutz or cities or uh, townships and they rape 100 women, so you think the proportion is that I go into his, uh, uh, Gaza and rape 100 people? Yeah, that is the council general of Israel embassy in Bangalore. I in, heard that interview. Yeah, so, so, so he, he said that is your aura. You, they have very woolly ideas of uh, let, let a terrorist fire next to their ear and then we will see. What will she... Uh, uh, it is very easy to be in an AC kind of a environment sitting in a news uh, studio and making these kind of statements. That proportionality. And what Israel has done? They said there will be collateral damage. Do not fire from hospitals, otherwise we will be forced to. They turn us the under one. Now they have given them three days. They have yet not started their ground offensive. They are saying, please wicked, please wicked, please wicked. That window has stopped. But still they have not gone. Maybe they are waiting for and Biden to come. That is graciousness of Gracious. Israel, right? Hey, secondly, they yes. released water also now. But it is, has, yes, released. but the narrative is still no, your children are dying, water you stopped, electricity, no internet. What, what I was being told that the UNICEF vehicles, the UN vehicles which are inside, they are being used to ferry these terrorists and their weapon systems from one, one place to another. This water which is meant for these hospitals is being utilized for by the, the, the carders, Hamas carders. Now, how, how do you stop that? You can't stop that. If you saw, there was a photograph I saw, it said aid from Japan for the Palestinian people in Gaza. Now that, it, 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 it was a sandbag. That was being used for revetment, for reinforcing a bunker. So this kind of thing. There was yesterday in the news, I saw someone holding a bag of Indian Basmati rice. There was no rice inside, there were bullets which were being carried. So, this kind of a narrative, so one has to see, one has to, you can't just get uh, influenced by a Malvi who says, yes, well, it's no civilian should suffer. If, but it is not a just war. Why did 1400 Israelis suffer? So, it is something like that. And who you started? can't sit back, you uh, have to uh, respond, absolutely. We will come to the last part of uh, what are the lessons for India? Uh, and firstly, before we go there, you firmly believe India must stand with Israel? Definitely. No questions to this. We are with the Palestinian people, but we stand firmly with Israel. We, stand, we should stand firmly with that they have a right to exist and exist peacefully. And you get into my house and destroy me, then please accept what a kind of a, a retribution and that retribution would be such that you will remember. So that is the stance and of course the Palestinians are suffering. So, so any, any war uh, uh, the, the civilians will suffer. There will be collateral damage. And so lessons for India. Oh, lessons for India. You see two, three things we need to understand. We are a rising power. But we are a soft power. We were softer earlier. Last 10 years, we've shown some spine. We've shown some resolve. Now, if you are a rising power, which is looking at overtaking USA in 2075 with a 55 trillion economy, if you look at the projection, and you are a 3.75 trillion economy now. So now, within the next 30, 40 years, if you are going to rise to be the second highest 
GDP in the world, then your organizations, your armed forces, your enforcement agencies, your police, your ED, your intelligence agencies have to also be able to protect, be able to reform, modernize, have that kind of technological thing that you are able to protect your interests when you are a 55 trillion economy. So everything has to rise, everything has to reform, everything has to modernize. That will only happen if you are strong inside, if there is a political will. If there is an Operation Ajay which is launched to take out 1000 plus Indians from Tel Aviv or, or Israel, something like that happened early from various countries all over the world. So that resolve will only happen if firstly there is a political will and then you have the ways and means to execute it. So if you have to project power that banner, if you have to tell the world that I will protect my interests like the US does now, you have to become stronger. And if you have to become stronger, then all these which constitute national power, comprehensive national power, CNP, which they call it, all these institutions and organizations have to rise. It is not only economy. You got to keep your powder dry. You have to have the intelligence agencies. You have to have the uh, various alliances and, and, and kind of a uh, sharing. In, 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 when Cargill happened, uh, USA refused to share the GPS data with us. We were blind the first few days. So we have to have that kind of a power where he dare not do it again to us. 71 gunpoint diplomacy, again there are two carrier battle groups which are in the Mediterranean. But they are against Jordan, Israel, Iran, uh, not Israel, Syria, Lebanon and Egypt that play ball, don't interfere. But the fact is we are going to replace USA in times to come. So we got to play, we have to punch at that level. We have started punching at our weight, but we have to start punching above our weight. And for that, diplomacy will be a, only a minor tool that the NSA goes, more the foreign minister goes. More soft and hard power. More soft and more hard. It has to be back. Only then it will happen.